Welcome to This Week in BJJ, the only show running the gamut of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and running it live every Friday night. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of This Week in BJJ. I'm Budo Jake. Today is November 1st and we got special guests today, Lloyd Irvin and his team. Starting on my left is Nigel Easton, Keenan Cornelius, JT Torres, DJ Jackson, Lloyd Irvin, and David Avalon. First, let's let's go back and talk about who you are and how you became who you are. Of course, Lloyd is uh, the leader of a relatively small but very successful jiu-jitsu team, also a black belt and uh, an internet marketer as well. Tell us a little bit about your path of how you got here today. Well, basically, I, I saw the UFC. It's always great to destroy everyone in the UFC, and I wanted to become a, a, a UFC fighter also. Um, found Leo Dalla and Mario Yamazaki. They had a school in Rockville, Maryland. Started training there. Um, got my blue belt in 30 days. Six months into it, um, Dalla had to leave, go back to Brazil for his own reasons. And at that point, I left the school and I started my own school. Six months in, blue belt with no instructor. And then from there, I got my black belt in three and a half years. And from there, I've just been trying to figure it out on my own and since built the team. So let's go back to that day when you're a blue belt teaching on your own. Is this in a garage or something? Well, it was actually a, in a 300 square foot um, facility in the back of a uh, fitness center. And how does how how did you go about teaching classes at the time when you were just uh, a blue belt? Well, the classes were really more so like um, MMA classes for myself. <laughs> like I was trying to fight, and I was actually um, competing in MMA at the time, called Valley Two at the time. And basically, everyone was coming in with more like. It was a fight club where they were basically trying to find my own training partners. I didn't have a curriculum to follow. I didn't have a process to model or do anything after. So it just came, come in, I showed whatever techniques I knew, and then we just trained. We didn't have any mats, didn't have any insurance, didn't have a, a phone. It was, you know, back in the day. Back then, I think things were a little more rigid in people's opinions on, on what constitutes a jiu-jitsu school and who should be teaching and who shouldn't be. Did you have a, get a lot of flack from other oh, instructors? major, major. Like, the thought of a blue belt teaching back then was, like, unheard of. Like, you know, even now it's kind of difficult, but in 1996, it was, it was completely unheard of. I was a black guy, blue belt, only been training six months, um, not, not, not Brazilian, so they had the challenges. Fast forward to now, you're leading an incredible team. Tell us a little bit about what goes into how guys get to your school. Do you select them? Do they select you? And how's that process work? Well, we have a full-blown traditional martial arts school. There's a lot of misconception where people think that, you know, all we do is compete, compete, compete. Well, what they see, the metal chaser, they see that competition side. But our school, 95% of our students don't even compete. We have a full-blown um, curriculum for beginners, intermediate guys that have no aspirations of competing. But what they see is the, what I call the metal chasers, our, our high-level competition team. And those people come from from either students that have come to our school and you have people throughout the world that you know want to become a part of it. Um, they like what they see and they reach out to me and, and you know request the opportunity to become a metal chaser. There's no there's not one exact process. Most of the guys either come here through a friend, like one of the guys may have a friend they know that somebody they recommend. Um, you have some guys that may just really, you know, just fly down and, and shoot their shot. But there's no one like you have to do this, this and that to become a metal chaser. Um, but the mass majority of people come, they're, they're students, and they come up through the ranks. Like, like DJ, DJ came in, his parents brought him in, uh, started training with us from white belt, oh, he's the black belt now. And then you have like guys like Keenan who came through, uh, his friend Andres sent me an email, sent me a, um, a long message, we went back and forth. So there's no one way. Recently you came out with a, a great reality show. Um, what's the name of the show? The Next World Champion. Mm -hmm. And why do you call it that? Because it's like all the guys, you know, from the MMA guys, we had the UFC champion Dominic Cruz. We have um, guys that won world championships at blue, purple, brown belt. And we're trying to get black belt world champions. So, like, all the guys that are doing MMA at the top level and doing jiu-jitsu at the top level, their goal are be is to become a world champion. So the, it's the perfect name, the next world champion. So you get to see all these guys whose goal is to become the next world champion. How important is it for you to develop a non-Brazilian World champion? Oh, it's, it's, it's super important because, um, like, I, want, I, I would like to see a, a Jiu Jitsu become an Olympic sport one day, and right now it's not even on that level, but. In the Olympics, you know, you have America, you have Brazil, you have Russia, Japan, you have all these teams, and people are happy for their country, right? And like I said, 
I've been here since a blue belt teaching by myself. Um, all American, we don't have any Brazilians like on our team that are competing per se. You know, my instructors um, who promoted me through my ranks, and he's Brazilian. But like I said, we've been doing it on our own. Um, We've been working hard, and it takes time. I, I didn't really have a model to follow because most people, like say, if I went to, if I say if I was from Gracie Baja or Alliance or one of the big teams, and I went through the ranks from white belt to black belt, when I came out of that process, I would have a model that to follow that I've been through, and then I can add my own little, you know, whatever, I, whatever I want to change on top of it. I didn't have that, so everything from the beginning is a learning process, is a process where I'm trying to uh, figure things out, and you know, like three to four years into a person's um, training, you know, they can expect to maybe be blue belt or purple belt. But what happens is I try, I try a new model or a new protocol. Everyone that's around when that protocol starts won't know the results of it until three or four years in, and then they're blue, purple, and I'll see if it worked or it didn't work. And if it didn't work, I'd make some adjustments, make some changes, so another three or four years to see if it works. And like I said, right now, it's probably around 2005, 2006, I started getting a real good, I've, I've been through enough three and four year processes to get my own formula. And like now, I, I think I have it dialed in. Like, like so now like, like he's come through the process, um, he, when was it, four years ago. Just like think, think about it, four years ago, he's competing as a white belt mm -hmm. and now he's competing some against the top guys and the guys like Keenan and JT all these guys are coming in now um, they're benefiting from all the trial and errors and so forth but we're, we're getting good results I know not all some of you guys train exclusively with Lloyd some he trained elsewhere Keenan what do you think is the biggest difference between Lloyd school and other schools out there um, probably just dedication mostly from Master Lloyd himself and then from the students and Master Lloyd uh, sort of instills that type of dedication in his students and it really just raises the whole level. I mean, you train super hard, too, harder than anywhere I've ever trained. I've trained almost all over the world. My dad is a, a martial artist since he was super young, too, so I've trained a lot of different gyms. I trained at PJ Penn's gym. I've actually been at a lot of different, uh, I've actually trained at Gracie Baja gym for a couple months with you, and uh, we just have some of the most intense training sessions ever. It's like a lot like uh, wrestling practices. I've been to, I, I wrestled for two months in high school, but even the wrestling practices back then aren't as hard as how we train. You say intensity. Do you mean drilling? All of it. Drilling, instruction, like even the instruction. Sometimes Master Lloyd, when he gets really like into, into teaching, he'll teach for three or four hours. It's like a seminar. Like two or, two or three weeks ago, Master Lloyd was teaching like three or four hours for like a week straight. It was just super intense instruction. And then, of course, we do a lot of hard drilling and a lot of hard rolling, too. It does seem like you really love what you do, don't you, Lloyd? With a passion. Like I'm, like I'm, 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 I'm like a obsessive like type guy. If I go into something and get involved in it, I go all in, or I don't do it. And how about you, DJ? Are I'm, you all in? Yeah, I'm all in. It's uh, the same thing. When I came in, I told Max Lloyd that my goal was to be a UFC champion. And he gave me the model. We sat down to talk, uh, do the jiu-jitsu first, and so like I just listen to what I'm told, like, like a soldier, like a perfect soldier, just do what I'm told, and I follow the system 100 percent, and I've got great results from following the system. Absolutely, incredible tournament results. And so, you're, are you saying that jiu-jitsu is a stepping stone for you? You're going to go into MMA next? Um, I wouldn't call it a stepping stone because I love jiu-jitsu, and even when I'm fighting MMA, I still will probably compete in jiu-jitsu, but MMA is the, the absolute goal. Mm -hmm. Some guys look at jiu-jitsu and talk about the fact how important it is to, to, to attack and to win in a beautiful manner. How do you think your jiu-jitsu is, DJ? Do you think you win in a beautiful manner? I think I win in a very beautiful manner. Like, I've been training for four years, and I'm fighting people who have been uh, black belts longer than I've been training. So it's like the fact, like, if I can go out there, pass someone's guard, and submit them with a Kimura, it's like, that's fantastic. But to think that, like, Cyborg is going to allow me to do that is naive of some people. Mm -hmm. At the highest level, it's hard to always get a submission, isn't yeah. it? And like, like you just mentioned, uh, DJ had an incredible weekend last uh, last weekend beating Cyborg at the uh, Abu Dhabi Pro Trials. So you'll be going to Abu Dhabi uh, next year, is that right? Yes, sir. Me and Keenan uh, so far, um, and the rest of the guys will be qualifying at later tournaments. JT, uh, last time we saw you was in Atlanta, and you suffered a concussion during that match. Is, did everything go okay? Yeah, it was actually in Boston. Boston, I'm sorry. You're yeah. Right. yeah, I did in a um, semifinal match with the Absolute, and um, it was early on, and I saw some of the tape I was going for, I believe I had an X guard position, I stood up with the leg, I went for an inside trip and I just went head first with the, with the guys weight following me behind and head first and I actually didn't remember the rest of the match. Um, I didn't I didn't remember winning, I, I don't remember losing, I don't remember anything. And I just remember after the match, I just left, left the venue, went to the parking lot, changed, came back, 
And Matt Sawyer's looking at me a little crazy. He's like, what are you doing? He says, they're calling you for the finals right now. I'm like, I lost, though. He's like, oh, man. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I didn't fight the finals after that. And I went to the hospital. They said I had a concussion and just had to sit out for a little bit, you know. I tried to come back to training the, the following week, and I still felt the effects of it. That's why I couldn't fight the Atlanta Open. I, just, I still felt weird, you know. I definitely felt the effect of it. And, and because of it, I wear, I wear a mouthpiece now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Keenan, I see you always wear a mouthpiece, too. Is that for the same reason? Um, I've had a couple of concussions, yeah, but not for, for concussion reasons because I've chipped my teeth a bunch, too. Hmm. Um, but I'm not sure how effective mouthpieces are as far as stopping you from getting your, cheap, your, teeth, your teeth chipped because like, I have a knee in the face, like direct on, and then your teeth chip off and they just get stuck in the mouthpiece. So at least you can hang on to them afterwards. Hmm. You don't lose them. Right? Speaking of injuries, David Avalon, the most uh, memorable uh, tournament uh, footage that a lot of people have of you is uh, at ADCC in Nottingham uh, against Polaris. How was your recovery from that? It was actually very quick. I was only on crutches for about a week, and I was walking right after that. Wow. I didn't have a, I couldn't get an MRI for a while, so I just self-rehabbed. You know, started walking, doing stairs, and by the time I went to a doctor to get an MRI, the guy looked at me and goes, your leg's fine. You got lots of little bruises and little tears, but nothing serious. Mm. So fortunately, the, all the, I had some meniscus tear or whatnot, but it was next to an artery, so it healed on its own. So I was back on the mat within three months. Wow. Looking back on that, do you think it was a mistake to uh, restart the match in that position? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, like, the thing is, that, and man, I'm not going to pull out of a match. You know, it doesn't matter the circumstances. The, the way I see it, like, there's always a way to win. You know, I didn't find it that time, but, you know, I'm always going to go out there and fight. But in hindsight, I wish I would have had a coach just go, no, don't do it. Because mm-hmm. I, I know I'm, I'm too proud, like, not to pull out. But right. I, I learned a lot from that experience. So. Right. Tell us a little bit about your relationship with Lloyd. Not a lot of people know that you're, I don't know if you'd call it an affiliate school, but you trained with Lloyd, um, but you're in Florida. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, uh, I'm trying to remember the year, but my brother had met with Lloyd, I think it was in uh, Grappler's Quest in New Jersey. I'm not sure. My brother probably knows the story better. But uh, we were at a point where our own school or business was really suffering, Mm -hmm. and we were in a really bad shape. And... Uh, Master Lloyd had took it upon himself to give my brother an opportunity to to shadow him, and from that opportunity, our school turned around instantaneously, and our business started doing well. And from that, you know, we became friend, great friends. And you know, he's uh, he's nice enough to let me come over here and, and to train with his guys. And you know, just echoing what everybody else said here, it's an amazing, amazing uh, facility, and just the way the classes are run, it's. I come from a wrestling background, so I can really appreciate like, how hard uh, they work, and they, and they push it to a whole other level. So, I mean, it's why you got guys like Keenan and, and JT and Nigel and DJ moving up so fast. You know, it's, it's not magic or anything. It's just a lot of hard work that most people are not willing to put in. Right. Nigel, you're putting in the hard work, too, I understand? Yeah. Yes, I am. Do you, are there a lot of tough women for you to train with? Uh, yes, I have uh, one of my top training partners, Sajara Eubanks, uh, who's a purple belt. Uh, but most of my training is with the, with the guys with here. The guys. Yeah, with the guys. Do you ever feel that you're kind of overshadowed by the guys' performances? No, 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 no. Um, I know that, uh, that I train hard, that I work hard, uh, just as the rest of the guys do. And we're a team, so, uh, you know, their victories are, are the same as my victories. So I never feel that way. I think the last time I saw you was in Atlanta, and uh, you'd signed up, but you didn't get any matches. Wasn't that right? Yeah. Sometimes uh, just at my weight class and at my belt level, uh, it's, you know, the, the largest tournaments like Europe and Pan Ams and Worlds are where I will normally have, you know, competition. Uh, other than that, I'm, you know, they're rooting uh, for my teammates. Still training because if someone's there, I'm still, you know, training as everyone else does. Uh, but, yes, at that particular tournament, there was no one who came. What's your take on uh, jiu-jitsu for women? in this day and age do you think it's uh, big enough or 
Well, there's always room to, to grow. Um, and I love the fact, you know, this was the first year that they separated uh, the women's brown and black belt division. So initially, you know, as a brown belt, my first three years, we were all combined. Um, so the fact that this year that it was separated has really just shown the growth. Uh, you know, we have women who are coming in, you know, to our academy every day who are interested uh, in the BJJ aspect, uh, not on the competition level, but just for the self-defense, you know, uh, getting in great shape. Uh, but I'm looking forward to more women, you know, joining because, you know, the more, uh, the better the competition is as well. Absolutely. Lloyd, who's going to be the next world champion at this table? Well, uh, there's a challenge going on right now because you got Naja, JT, and DJ who are all going into black belts, and they're all vying to be the uh, – next world champion uh, at the black belt level and Naja always jokes that she gets to go first her division's up first <laughs> and she she actually was the first um, world champion on Team Lawyer Urban ever and uh, at the purple belt level in 2007 uh, she got she got uh, she fought before Ryan Hall she won then Ryan Hall won later on that day and um, it started off from there of course, it's uh, rewarding in its own right to win a world championship medal. But is there any kind of incentives? Do you give them any kind of a contest? Or well, yeah, I give them incentives for everything. Like we have money moves and different specific moves, and if you do specific moves in specific tournaments, you get money. So it's like, like I did this before. Like the UFC was doing the special money moves. So always incentives. And then if you have certain matches and you win certain matches, they get incentives for that too. Talking about cash prizes. Oh yeah. You think that's? Do you think the medal itself is not enough? No, I mean, people want the medal, but like I said, we just like having fun, like, because it makes a person want to go out and, 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 and do something. Like, one time we had Keenan, we had a, a, a position where you get, a, I think it was 500 bucks for to finish an armbar certain way. He, was, he had the guy in a position, so he was trying, 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 but he, I don't think he had dr drilled it enough, so he just gave up on it and, like, and went for another to finish the guy with something else. But like I said, it's just fun, you know, something to keep the team motivated, you know. Like, DJ wins a lot of the money moves, and um, – <laughs> So it's just fun. It's something we do in our school. And I even do it for my UFC guys. Like when uh, like Brandon Barry was fighting, like he had money moves. If you saw him and Frank Mirror, there was a move he was going for. He was trying to. It was like five thousand dollars if he could hit it, but he almost got it. But it's just fun. So just to clarify, a money move is where you're going to give them a cash bonus if they hit a particular move. Correct. And then we have specific moves, so like they'll they'll text me and say, "What's the money move for the Europeans?" So I, I may send like four moves over and tell which which move, how much money is attached to each move, and then but they have to have it on video, and that's the only stipulation. Have any of you guys ever gone for one of those moves and and ended up in a bad position for it? No, no, I can remember now. Uh, the the most one that I got close to the bad position was when the rolling knee bar was a money move, mm -hmm. and like I used to go for that all the time. But I actually went for it when I fought in the um, the Gracie Worlds. It's like I went for it on what's the name? Uh, the heavyweight where I, that I fought the, uh, in the Gracie Worlds in the finals of the division, and I went for rolling knee bar, and he almost smashed me down. And I almost got locked down in, in half guard, but I ended up getting out and getting back to my feet, and I didn't go for that one again. <laughs> Most of them are submissions, too, so if you're going to go for submission, you're probably in a dominant position anyway, so right. it's pretty unlikely that you're going to get put in a bad position from there. Okay. What's the money move for this weekend, Lloyd? Uh, I haven't thought about it yet. <laughs> I have about by, by Friday. All right. Hey, you guys, don't go anywhere. we still got lots more Lloyd Irvin and his team. We'll be right back. BudoVideos.com, in association with the International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation, bring you the 2012 World Jiu-Jitsu Nogi Championships. To accommodate the overwhelming interest to compete, this event is now a two-day affair, and BudoVideos.com will be bringing it to you live with our exclusive and groundbreaking multi-mat technology. Every match will be shown. That's two full days, eight hours a day on 10 mats. You do the math. The 2012 Nogi World Championships, broadcasting live November 3rd and 4th, exclusively at BudoVideos.com.